Amen. Just want to acknowledge the presence of Brother and Sister McDonald. Can you just wave to us in the back there? They are like my second parents. So I'm so good to see you here with us worshiping. I pray that God will continue to keep you and preserve you and strengthen and bless you. Now, since I know we're hungry, I won't keep you too long. I won't wear out my welcome, I promise you. I just got one text. It's found in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. And there, John the Revelator tells us, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, every four years, a group of mainly white men and a few women travel around this country by plane, train, and automobile seeking votes to become the president of the United States. In state after state, city after city, town after town, they meet fellow citizens with the goal of convincing them that they alone are worthy to be the president. They kiss babies, they pump gas, they tell funny, funny stories, they throw out the first pitch at baseball games, I've even seen them buy groceries on camera. And then, you know, when they're at public events, they, 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 they will place their hands over their hearts when the national anthem is sung so that they will convince everyone that they are just ordinary Joes like you and me. Although many of them come from the elite classes, they, they want you to believe that they can empathize with your pain. They know what you're feeling. They, they, they know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. They know what it's like to have a sick child and no insurance to pay for that child. They know what it's like to take public transportation because you can't afford to buy or even to fix the car you own. They know what it's like to open the refrigerator and wonder where the next meal will come from. These qualities, they believe, will make them worthy to be the president. On the campaign trails, we hear promises that suggest a new America one that is truly great for all people. They promise us universal health care. They promise quality education for our children. Uh, they promise to bring America together and to, and to make peace with our enemies. They promise to reduce violent crime and, and to promote community policing where, where the police will live in the neighborhood where they work. They also promise a strong military that will be a force for good around the world while at the same time promising to reduce the proliferation of nuclear weapons. They, they, they promise to defeat terrorism no more Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and the Taliban and Boko Haram. They're going to get rid of all these groups. They promise to reduce gun violence, no more school shootings. Yet at the same time, they promise to preserve 
and uphold the Second Amendment's right to bear arms. They promise racial harmony while making America great again. Hmm. We've gone through this cycle of campaigning with unfulfilled promises 45 times. We've had 45 presidents, and we are still not saved. Have mercy. I got to tell you, when the 44th president was elected, I, I saw a ray of hope. His, his key phrase during the campaign was, yes, we can. Universal health care, yes, we can. Racial reconciliation, yes, we can. The end of war on terror, yes, we can. Peace on earth, yes, we can. His, his catchphrase soon turned into, yes, we did. I watched on TV like millions of Americans when he took the oath of office. His ascendancy to become the president was epic. 30, th 232 years after the founding of this great nation, a black man became the president. You're not, you're not getting it, you're, you're quiet. You're, you're, you're pensive, but think about it. In 2008, a black man became the representative of the government of these United States. He was in charge of the federal government. He, he was in charge of the Department of Justice. He, he was the head of the military. He, he, he had the CIA, FBI, and Homeland Security under his thumb. He was the man, in my view, to bring the country together. He would negotiate treaties and agreements on behalf of the United States. If he said we were going to be friends with Iran, we would become friends with Iran. See, this man was part white and part black. The colonizer and the colonized in one package. Mercy. He knew what it was like to be rich and poor. He was the one worthy to take the mantle and to lead this nation into a new horizon. He became the one to uphold and execute that holy document we call the Constitution of the United States. This same document that called African Americans three-fifths of a person now had a three-fifths running things. Number 44 swore on a Bible and said these faithful words, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Mercy. He kind of got the words fumbled that first time, and they had to do it over again. But he still said them. He still said them. He, he was not just the chief executive, but the chief defender of the Constitution. The Constitution directs our past, our present, our future. It tells us our rights and our privileges and our freedoms. This text is sacred to the people of the United States. After the oath of office, number 44, who represented three-fifths of a person, became worthy to defend the sacred scroll, the Constitution of the United States. It's a document that binds us as a nation. Boy, 
Those eight years went by pretty fast. Despite many accomplishments, 44 got dumped and we got trumped. The current allegations against number 45 clearly suggests that he ain't worthy. He, he is accused of colluding with the enemy. He is accused of sleeping with the enemy. Truth be told, the truth is not in him. Mercy. 2,000 years ago, a similar scene unfolded. Stay with me this afternoon. But this scene unfolded not on earth, but in heaven. John the Revelator witnessed an amazing scene in heaven. He saw a throne, and upon that throne sat one who looked like jasper and sardine. He saw a rainbow over that throne, the symbol of God's promise of mercy. He saw 24 elders clothed in white raiment with crowns on their heads. These elders represented the redeemed from the earth and they surrounded the throne. I just want you to know this afternoon that there are 24 people up there who look like me and you. 24 people up there who sinned and were redeemed, and they're now in heaven. There is hope. There is hope. But as this scene unfolds further, John tells us that he saw a sea of glass that was like crystal. He saw beasts that were, in fact, angels, and these angels and, and elders worshipped him who sat on the throne. He saw lightning and thunder and voices emanating from God's throne. And, and as God sat on his throne, the angels declared that God is holy, holy, holy. And, and the elders removed their crowns and fell on their faces and declared only God alone is worthy to receive honor and glory and power. Mercy. Because God is holy, he is worthy of our worship and our praise. What, what a beautiful and majestic scene depicting true worship of God. Praise team, I want you to listen now. All at once it appears that God's created beings are in unison regarding who he is and how he should be worshipped. There is unity of purpose. The praise leader is not asking the faithful to stand in heaven to, to, to praise and worship God. The singing is in unison it is beautiful, the praise is powerful, and the presence of God is overwhelming. Everybody is on their feet, giving praise and glory and honor to the one seated on the throne. I want to submit to you that true worship does not take place only on Sabbath or during midweek. It is constant, purposeful, and perpetual. We should seek to be in God's presence on all occasions by living a submitted life. But as this scene unfolds further in heaven, th there is something that disturbs Brother John. As he peeks behind the heavenly curtains and surveys the majesty and the grandeur of God sitting on his throne in his heavenly temple, all is not bliss. You see, 
We, we know we, we live in a world filled with temptations and troubles and trials, but the expectation is that there will be peace in heaven. But the scriptures tell us that there is a scroll in the hand of him sitting on the throne. And the scriptures describe the scroll as written on front and back. It is sealed with seven seals. And an angel then poses the existential question of the millennium. Who is worthy to open the scroll in the right hand of him sitting on the throne? There is no campaign to make one worthy to open and take the scroll. There, there, there is no amount of wealth that one can have and use to purchase the scroll in the right hand of him sitting on the throne. And you may ask yourself, what, what is that scroll all about? Ellen White tells us, in Acts of the Apostles, in his open hand lay the book, the roll of prophetic history of God's providences. The prophetic history of nations and churches. Herein was contained the divine utterances. His authority, his commandment, his laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. In other words, in the hand of him sitting on the throne in heaven is the constitution of the universe. And the Bible tells us that John wept bitterly because of the de declaration that there was no one worthy on earth to take the scroll. This meant that there was no one worthy to lead earth, no one worthy to represent the delegation from earth. There was no one worthy to sit at the right hand of the one already on the throne until an elder stopped praising to tell John, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ has prevailed. What made the lion of the tribe of Judah worthy? He is worthy because the lion is a lamb. Have mercy. Christ's victory on the cross has made him worthy to take the scroll. He is worthy because he became one of us. He who knew no sin took on sinful nature. He hungered, he grew weary, he was homeless, he was tempted as we are and yet without sin. He worked as a carpenter, he, he visited the sick, he bound up the brokenhearted, he was beaten for our chastisement, and he bled and he died. In him was divine and human DNA. He was king and subject at the same time. He was priest and sacrifice all in one. And he was born of a woman and died as a martyr and rose as the king of kings and lord of lords. When John saw him, he roared as a lion on behalf of the disenfranchised and he died as a lamb. He had no army, but he conquered the nations. By virtue of his death, he redeemed humanity from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nations to make us a kingdom and priest to our God. 
Oh, John, stop weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He prevailed over sin. He prevailed over sickness. He prevailed over broken hearts. He prevailed over sorrow. And he prevailed over death. He alone is worthy to take the scroll and to sit at the right hand of the Father. Oh, John, stop weeping. Christ has taken the covenant scroll. He is now the head of the universe by virtue of his worthiness. He now commands the heavenly host made up of angels. He is the high priest with direct access to the Father. Our prayers go up and his blessings come down. He is the head of heaven's army, victorious in battle. Because he has the scroll in his hands, the destiny of the church is secure. It will prevail even against the gates of hell. Amen. Satan will send a flood, but Jesus will open the wilderness. Satan will send persecution for the church, but the blood of the saints will be the seed that will spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Weep not, John. Jesus has begun to reign, and he has begun a reign with no end. He has established a kingdom with no border and a kingship that will last throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. At the moment Christ took the scroll, the adoration and cries and cries of acclamation that belong only to the Father were, not, were then directed to him as the Son. Now when the acclamation to give glory and honor to him seated on the throne is heard, the elders fall down and lay their crowns before the throne and worship the one sitting on the throne. The same honor that is given to the Father becomes the honor and worship that's given to the Son, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Weep not, John. It's now seated upon the throne. The Lion has ransomed former slaves from all tribes and tongues and peoples and all nations and made them one kingdom. I've come this afternoon to tell you the same thing that the elder told John. Weep not. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. There is no other to come, whether he is Obama or Trump. It's not them, it's Jesus. There is no future election. His election is permanent and your calling is sure. In his hands, he has the scroll that controls your destiny. The lion of the tribe of Judah knows and controls all of God's providences towards you. That means that no enemy can take you out of his hands. Your future is secure if he remains your Lord and Savior. This means that no circumstance in your life catches Jesus unprepared. He has peered down through the corridors of time and prepared a table in the presence of your enemies. Struggles may come, disappointments may occur, but your victory in Jesus is secured. Weep not. The destiny of this nation we call the United States of America is in the hands of Jesus. Whatever plots and schemes Trump has, whatever walls he wants to build, whatever wars he wants to promote, 
he can go no further than, than what he is permitted to do by the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus sets up kings, and at the appointed time, he takes them down. Weep not. Don't worry about what you see taking place in God's church, even this church. If it seems like the church is about to fall apart, I want you to know this afternoon that the root of David has prevailed. And that means because he has prevailed, we will be victorious. The church beset by controversy and doctrinal debates will soon become the church united by the Spirit with a message that will shake the very foundations of the earth. I said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Weep not. Even where men defy God's law, mock his justice, and reject his mercy, the lion has the scroll and controls the destinies of those who love and those who reject him. God is not blind to the injustices we see in the world today. The greed of the rich, the predations of the powerful, the exploitation of the meek, will be judged by him alone who is worthy to take the scroll. Weep not because of his enthronement upon the throne of heaven. He has unleashed the power of the Holy Spirit to transform your life. Listen to what Ellen G. White says about this. Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he, enthr he was enthroned amongst the, uh, amidst the adoration of angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed... The Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents. And Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. He had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had as priest and king received all authority on earth and was anointed the one over his people. I've come to tell you this afternoon, weep not. You might be feeling sorry for yourself, worried about your future, concerned about your present, distressed, about your life, I've come to tell you that Jesus has the scroll that controls your life. As you rest your confidence in him, he prepares a place for you in the presence of your enemies. We need to realize that we are in a protected class, and that class is called the redeemed. This world creates all kinds of labels that have no real meaning or impact on a person's destiny. It doesn't matter if you're black or white, rich or poor, American or British. It does not matter if you're tall or short. The only categories in this life that matter is if we are redeemed or unredeemed. There will be poor and rich people going to hell together. There will be black and white going there too. Only the redeemed will meet the Lord in the air. The, the, the psalmist admonishes the redeemed of the Lord to say so. This means that you have been rescued from the depths of hell and are now destined for the courts of heaven. Whatever trials we have now will be swallowed up in victory. Now is not the time for weeping, but for working. 
With the power of the Holy Spirit, we must declare that there is one worthier than Trump, mightier than the Prince of Wales, more accomplished than LeBron James. He is yet to lose in the finals of life. We have got to tell the world that the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. I don't know who won last night, y'all. Some, it seemed like some of y'all know. Some of y'all know. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> Jesus won. Amen. Jesus won last night. <laughs> Jesus, when he was on earth, repeatedly told redemption stories. He told of a man who owned 100 sheep. On the way home, one of the sheep got lost in the wilderness. He secured the safety of the 99 and went out and found the missing sheep. And Jesus goes on to say, there was rejoicing within the camp when he found the missing sheep. Jesus also told the parable of the, of the prodigal son. This was about a son who willfully left his father's house, gave up his inheritance, for loose women and fast cars. And when he was at his lowest, he returned to the father. The Bible says that when he came home, the father could not contain himself. He ran to meet and hugged him and kissed him and then threw a celebration in his honor. Then there is the parable of the lost coin a woman loses a coin, and she tears up her house to find it. And when she finds it, she calls her neighbor to come over and to rejoice with her. The moral of each parable is that there is joy in heaven when one sinner finds redemption. The Bible tells us that when he took the scroll, the angels and the elders sang a new song of worship and praise. This afternoon, it's time for us to sing a new song. We must lift up Jesus in praise and honor and glory because he has prevailed. Because he prevailed, we will not only prevail, but we will overcome. Every time we come to worship, it must be a moment of great joy and celebration because we have been redeemed. It's not time to weep, but it's time to worship the God we love. We do not worship because God put food on our table. We do not worship because God woke me up this morning. We do not worship because he started me on my way. We worship because we have been redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I have been set free. I have been restored. I have been made new. I have a fresh start. I am a new creation. I am a new creature. I have a new name, and I'm here to worship the God that I love. In closing, when I look back over my life and I see the depths with sin cause me to plunge to, and I see the height to which the grace of God has brought me, I can do nothing else but to worship the God that I love. He alone is worthy of my worship and my praise and my honor and my glory and my hope and my past and my present and my future. I've come to tell you this afternoon that the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed and it is time to worship the Lord that we love. God bless you.